Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our um, students on campus, and welcome to those that are watching online. We're going to have a panel discussion called The Rise of the Creative Entrepreneur. It should be very interesting. Uh, my name is Paul Cagle, and I'm course director in the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Master of Science degree program. It's a program for students that want to start their own business. So we're very excited today to have a, we have a spectacular panel uh, to talk with you today. And all of these panelists are full sale graduates, of course. All are highly successful entrepreneurs and all are inductees in our Hall of Fame. So let's welcome our panelists. First up is founder and executive director of Royale and 2009 Hall of Fame inductee, Jason Whitmore. Next is founder of Make Amazing and 2013 Hall of Fame inductee, Kim Alpert. <laughs> Next is creative director and co-founder of Nathaniel James and 2014 Hall of Fame inductee, Nathaniel Howe. Sound designer, author, and 2014 Hall of Fame inductee, welcome Rick Veers. Hey, Rick. And last but not least, co-founder of Creature Art and Mechanics and 2014 Hall of Fame inductee, Tim Naylor. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. We're very excited that you're here. And we're going to talk about how do you, how do you strike a balance between a creative, um, a creative endeavor and business, paying the bills, marketing, the finance, and all that. So why don't we just start out by, if you could tell us a little bit about your business. Uh, Tim, you want to start? Sure. Um, my business is we're a small technology and visual effects company. We do two different things. Um, we write specialized technology to augment like Maya. We write a ton of plugins. Um, and we offer creature development services for film, for games. So we'll work with game companies and we'll work with VFX vendors or movie studios to work on their films and provide either technology consulting or actual asset development um, for different projects. Great. Uh, I own the Detroit Chop Shop. We're the, uh, currently the world's largest producer of sound effect libraries. And uh, I also own Blast Wave Effects, which is a sound effects publishing company. And so we make uh, products that are licensed and purchased for use in video games, movies, television shows, all that kind of stuff. So. I'm the uh, co-founder and creative director at Nathaniel James. Uh, we do motion graphics, design, and animation. Uh, we focus uh, specifically on television, promo, and titles. I run Make Amazing, and we are a creative strategy firm. So we do nimble teams that scale up to build anything that's the convergence of art and media, um, typically around advertising, but it never stops there. And um, I am the uh, executive creative director and founder of a company called We Are Royale. And um, we primarily focus on design, animation, uh, digital, and production. So a lot of stuff that it pertains mostly to, uh, to advertising and all things creative in television world. Good. So I'm sure we'd all be interested to know how you got started in your own business. Can you take us from full sale student to entrepreneur? Sure. Tim, go ahead. Um, graduated digital media program in 97. Um, worked for a defense contractor doing some virtual reality. And then in 2001, got a call by Industrial Light and Magic to come on out and work for uh, episode Star Wars Episode Two, uh, so I moved out to the Bay Area in '01, and then I was at Lucasfilm and ILM for about 10 years, and then worked for Digital Domain for about a year and a half, 
And then um, we left and four of us um, started our own company in 2012. Uh, I graduated um, from Full Sail. I moved uh, back to Detroit and um, I started looking for work and I found uh, the freelance uh, market worked well for me right off the, uh, right off the bat. I, I'm kind of a free spirit so the idea of working for someone just, <clears throat> just never, I, I, I don't know, it just doesn't sit well with me. It's just not my personality. So I like the idea of freelancing because it allowed me to start <clears throat> making money and getting started in the industry without technically being under somebody. But uh, there's just something in me. I want to be the captain of my own ship. I also want to clear my throat. Give me a second. It was pretty late last night last night. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I want to be the captain of my own ship. And, um, and so I started the Detroit Chop Shop because I wanted to make the projects that I wanted to work on. I didn't necessarily want to answer to somebody. I wanted to create my own art and figure out a way to sell that. And so that's kind of what led me on my path. Um, when I was a student here, I was interested in uh, visual effects and film and match moving and compositing. Uh, I became friends with some people in the digital media program and they showed me the world of motion graphics and uh, it really appealed to me because uh, my impression of the film market was that um, you actually had, unless you're very high up, maybe less creative uh, say and, and uh, less kind of malleability of the project to kind of do what you want on it. So I saw motion graphics as this opportunity where you could come up with a concept, you could design the look of it, the feel of it, and then animate it. I saw a lot of freedom in that. And the freedom, you know, we're talking here about being an entrepreneur. I think the freedom probably appeals to everyone on this panel in some way or another. So I graduated. I worked with Christy Ansley in placement. I had some offers uh, after graduation. I ended up deciding to take a job in a smaller market. I went to Charlotte, North Carolina to a very small boutique uh, motion graphics studio. I did that very consciously uh, with the advice of Christy from Placement. And the idea was that I would build up my reel and my portfolio uh, to be able to skip some steps on the ladder before I went out to the larger markets of LA and New York. Um, so I worked there for a few years, put together a reel, uh, did a lot of self-promotion on the boards, um, got out to LA, started freelancing, uh, had a very successful freelance career, worked for a lot of big studios out there, um, got to travel around the world, saw a lot of people uh, and how they operated motion graphics studios and I learned a lot. Uh, you know, along the way I was kind of taking notes and uh, keeping track of my mind of what I saw that I liked and what I saw that I felt I would do differently if I had a studio. So freelancing and being a lot of places was like a playbook into how other people did things. So uh, that really kind of had an impact on how I've done my company now. Um, about four years ago, five years ago, uh, my business partner, he approached me and uh, made me an offer if I wanted to leave the freelance world and kind of try and start something with him. At the time, I was doing uh, branding work directly with the athlete and boxer Manny Pacquiao. And so I was kind of in his world and traveling with him a lot and doing a lot of things. Uh, so I kind of turned it down at first. Um, then that kind of voice and the echo of it kept kind of repeating in my ear. And I remember I was sitting with my wife at sushi and, and I remember one day when mentally I made the switch and I said, you know what, I'm gonna have my own studio. Maybe this is the time. Uh, so we partnered up and you know we're four years into the business now and I'm very grateful I did it. I think uh, being an entrepreneur and combining the creativity and business uh, is thrilling. I enjoy where creativity and business intersect and that's what I do every day. That was really good. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Um, I, like, well, I wanna talk about something else. I'm like, oh, that was really good. Maybe think about this. Um, I came up uh, through advertising channels as a graduate. I'm so sidetrack minded. And, uh, you know, started out at big firms like Leo Burnett and did, you know, contract work at Draft and experienced momentum and, and all these different firms. And at the same time that I was doing design and I was doing interactive and I was doing advertising, I was also creating my own work and doing fine art and existing in the gallery world. And they were two very different lives. And there reached a point a few years ago where I realized that I needed to make a company that would sit between those two lives so that I could focus on that and grow it. And um, in a very like cliche going out to the desert kind of way, I went out to the desert and was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna build something, what does it look like? And, and found that vision and, uh, and took that jump. What desert? 
Sir, I was in the Mojave Desert. Okay, okay cool. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> um, well, I actually, um, so I've been in the business now for a while, um, almost 16 years, and um, I was right there where you guys were 16 years ago. Uh, I see some familiar faces, hi guys. Um, and um, I honestly never thought that I would start a business, only because I remember when I graduated Full Sail, I had a real long resume, and I'd quite, I didn't quite know what to do with all of the knowledge that had been bestowed upon my plate. So I believe that my business card probably was this long. I wanted to be like a director, a uh, sound engineer, uh, I don't know, it was, it was crazy. Um, and then when I got out, um, I mean, initially I came to school here to do music. So um, I think what's kind of interesting about your lives and your careers is that it's okay not to know where you're gonna end up because I didn't. Um, where, and I know, how many of you are nervous right now to get out of school, right? I know, it's scary. <laughs> but the, the reality is that once you um, step foot into what we like to call the real world, um, something kind of takes over uh, you and then you just kind of, you have to figure it out because it's, it's either sink or swim at that point. <clears throat> so when I, um, I ended up going out to Los Angeles when I was 19, no, sorry, I was 20, um, in my 87 Dodge Caravan, uh, barely made it over the Rockies, and then um, uh, landed in LA, and I got my first job. I talked my way into it. My demo reel was real not good. Um, real, real, real bad, actually. <laughs> I got laughed at at my first uh, job interview, which was awesome. Um, and uh, I just picked up the next day and just kept going. And that's been sort of the theme of my career. Um, the first company that I was a part of called Pittard Sullivan went out of business after a year and a half. And then I got laid off for my second job at uh, this company called Belief. And then I went freelance. I was kind of forced into the freelance world. It was really scary to be freelance. Um, but I learned to, to enjoy it. And really from freelancing, that's when I had sort of a, a uh, base camp for starting a business, but I never thought I wanted to start a business. But what's interesting in your career and in your life, you'll meet some people where you're just, you, you have this feeling that this is right, you know? So I, I met my two business partners. I have, I had no idea what I was doing. I kind of still don't, um, even though I am a business owner. I'm learning every day. I know a lot now about, um, the entrepreneurial side as well as uh, the number side of, of creating commercial art. Um, it's, there's a difference, by the way, between a fine artist and a commercial artist. Fine art is for yourself. Commercial artists, we're here to sell the product, you know, and to do a really great job at, at communicating that vision. So that's kind of, you know, now I have a studio in Los Angeles and one in Seattle. We're about 75 people now. Um, and uh, doing some really fun, exciting stuff. So I'm, I'm very proud and honored to, to be the, at the head of that. Good. Thank you all. Uh, let's follow up on that, Jason. You, you were talking about, we are talking about, okay, you, all of you started out as, as creative, then you're creative and you're making money, and then it turns into creative making money, and then you have a business, and now you have people, and you've got all kinds of things to worry about, sales and uh, orders and contracts. How do you balance those things? That's the big thing we want to talk, talk about today. How do you balance being a creative person and running a business and making money and keeping customers happy and all that? Anybody? Yeah, you know, I think uh, knowing what to ignore is just as important as knowing what to focus on. Uh, when you run a business uh, every single day, and you know, my company, uh, we're newer than Jason's. We, you know. 75 people, that's a, that's a large company you're running. So I know just, you know, I have a smaller studio and every day there's uh, a million pitfalls that I could get wrapped up in that would just consume my time, my energy, and my focus. So I think, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels between being a designer and being a business owner to me. Um, let's say you're a designer or you're a creative person. I feel like your job is really to uh, distill something down to its essence and then articulate it in a way that's unique or that's focused. 
And I feel like in business, the key to business to me is knowing how to laser focus in on what really matters. There's so many people in business that will come up to you and say, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to think about that, make sure you do this and that. Uh, maybe, you know, the only thing you really need to do is make sure X, Y, Z happens that day and you're golden. So uh, learning how to ignore certain things and learning what is important, remembering uh, what you're selling, as, as silly as that sounds, uh, people get all kinds of sidetracked with their businesses. So remembering the heart of what you're doing, uh, making sure that client is taken care of and that the creative that you're selling is really truthful to their brief and really satisfies their needs um, and, and giving it an earnest effort uh, every day to, to just stay focused. I think the key to business to me and balancing it is to have self-efficacy, to be self-effective of uh, what you're going to do with your time and where your time is most needed to be spent. Uh, and, and you know, the rest is just kind of keeping people on track, keeping people with their eyes on the prize. It's like just kind of keeping that course set, you know, and, and keeping the larger vision in mind. So that's been my experience with, with that balance. Do you want more answers? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel very official at this table with these mics, so I'm gonna keep being like in my deposition says, Kim, what do you think? <laughs> I think for me, the biggest, the biggest lesson about time was to not spend energy, like when I first started, doing the things that I'm not good at that are the things that I do, aren't my part of the job. So like, I'm not an accountant. So finding an accountant has freed up a ton of time, you know, a lawyer, you know, finding people that you can, you know, as a small company, you know, staff when you need them to do the things that you need because your time is best spent doing what you do and carving out your process and how your business functions because your business is what you're producing and it's going to be very different than someone else's business and what they're producing. And their pipeline percentage of turnover for completion is going to be really different than yours because you sell differently. So there's no formula that's going to be like the perfect fit the further that you can get in like being able to see everything at once and not getting in the weeds, you're gonna be able to start developing what that process looks like and getting things faster. And um, I think that was one of the best decisions that I made early on was really dedicating my time to doing what I do best, focusing on the branding, the positioning, the strategy, the products themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, not time starving myself with being a business, mm -hmm. the business lady. Mm -hmm. I, I actually have, um, uh, it's, it's actually been kind of interesting watching my career morph in the way <clears throat> that it has and sort of my, um, now my job is uh, to make sense of things, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, I have a client that comes to me and so my job basically is to make, because it's business, right? So business runs on money, right? Because we all want to get paid, right? So. Um, we're not doing this for free or we wouldn't have houses and we wouldn't be able to buy clothes. And so um, it's important to always keep in mind, I think as a creative, we operate as, you know, from a very emotional place and that's where I come from. But then when it comes down to business and it's just numbers, uh, it's been really interesting to watch how my role has, has changed to understand the side of creating and then the understand the side of business. And so when we start talking about, you know, hey, I have a client, super cool project, completely underfunded. I don't know, I'm gonna have to take a chance and a risk. Either I break even, so in business, you have to make profit, right? It's the extra money on top of the money that you make that keeps your studio open, that buys the coffee, that pays the rent, that pays, you know, my salary, that pays, um, you know, my, my, my time is no longer billable to j actual jobs in, in the studio. So. Um, but I am the captain of the ship, so I, I need to get paid as well. So um, I think what's been interesting is that when a client comes to you with a really great project, how do you put on your, your business cap and say, you know, I don't know if you guys have been, if they've explained like an expensive render versus a cheap render. Well, there's, there's a, a point in which you have to make sure that you come up with a plan that is a plan that is not gonna put you out of business, if you know what I mean? Because you don't wanna to agree to something 
and then underwhelm and, and set up high expectations. Um, because at the end of the day, as a business, I'm a part of a community. So I can't underbid or undersell what it actually costs to do the job. Or else then I put my, my you know, my, um, my friends in the business in, in jeopardy of setting a standard that's unrealistic. And so you guys have seen this happen um, over and over in the media as of late, VizFX companies going out of business because expectations are high, <clears throat> budgets are low, um, you're unable to uh, support your staff. So it's a fine balance of <coughs> doing really great creative f on a budget, you know, and money makes it the world go round. <laughs> Good. Gonna, oh, you oh, go ahead. Anybody else? Yeah, we both want to go. Okay. Um, one of the things, too, that we found is we, we have about 35 employees, and they're all incredibly seasoned veterans. I think everyone has at least 15 years' experience in film. And one of the things that we realized early on is that if we didn't give everyone some transparency in terms of the macro of what was happening on the business end and some of the decisions that we were facing on a daily basis, we found that people really wanted to know that. And granted, there are some decisions you, you need to know when to draw the line where your employees just don't need to know <coughs> that that decision needs to happen and what decisions you're actually holding you know, on a daily basis. But we, we discovered something interesting is that one of the ways we built more investment into how our employees were conducting themselves on a daily basis was that we became more transparent about the decisions that we were facing and the risk that we were at. And not to scare them into anything, but what, what actually transpired is that they became more interested in how they can contribute into the business. And our responsibility levels and accountability levels on all, you know, whether you were making the final decision, like myself and my business partners, or you were an employee on the box doing the work, is that if they only had the myopic view of what they were doing every day and this was their world, then you can get a lot of productivity out of someone. But if you expanded that just a little bit to help them understand the macro context of what was going on in the company and where they fit in that process and how important they were in that process, it really started to transform how they felt about the company that they were providing their skills into each and every day. And a lot of times in the creative industry, there's been this pretty clear separation between management and business and how it conducts itself and the artist and just can you just get the software to do it what it does and get those pixels on the screen for us that's great and the blend typically especially in large vfx houses doesn't hasn't happened it hasn't transpired and what we've learned is by getting people more into what's happening in the company they actually have helped us with how to frame a lot of the business decisions that we do they become interested in what is the next thing, what's going on in the project, what's happening, and they see things differently from their point of view. And we bring them into that. And so as you go out into the real world, and you're, whether you decide to start your own business from day one out of here, or whether you're an employee coming into a business and becoming an employee that's thinking not just so supremely myopic on what you're clicking every day on the mouse, or whatever you're doing with the soundboard, but understanding the greater context of what's going on in the business, what decisions the business owners are probably have to make day in and day out, you become so much more valuable inside the context of the company. And I think that's a really important thing that sometimes the creative industry, whether it be audio or VFX, is lacking. And I think that's a, that's a really good thing to kind of come out of school with and go, how do I enter into a company and learn more about the business model? Learn about the industry. It's not just learning the software and becoming a master of your craft. That's incredibly important. But it's also understanding the context where, where in which environment you're in. Because as a business owner, I would love to have employees, and I'm thankful that I do, that understand where they're at and where we're at in the business, and I can help get more feedback on how to make the right decision from my employee base, who we're really, they're not really my employees, they become more my teammates. And that's a big transition to move them, in my opinion, out of just an employee only to like people that I want to walk this journey with. That's a huge difference. So as you come out having that 
non my like you can exist in the macro 30,000 foot level and you can exist in I need to solve this problem with this software it's driving me nuts to be able to do both things during the day is really an awesome characteristic to have as you go out into the industry okay. yeah I mean for me the bulk of what I do <clears throat> yeah, my voice is clearing up uh, the bulk of what I do in the products that are produced are produced by me so I'm kind of like um, you know, the master chef, so I've got the recipe and I actually make the sound effects myself. And so there's the, there's always the struggle between being creative and then doing the business. And, and I think that the problem is this, is business is all about rules. It's all about setting up structure so that you can, you know, make profit. The creative on the other end is it's a world of, there's no rules. And so this, it's two totally different hats that you have to wear and it can be very challenging um, especially because I'm one of those people, I'm a switch. So I'm either, I'm in one mode or the other. Sometimes I'll toggle between the two, but generally I'm all in on one side or I'm all in on the other. It's very challenging for me to be in business mode, planning, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden I want to put on the creative hat because when I put on the creative hat, it's kind of like, you know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's like when he puts on that, when he puts on that swanky sweater, he's ready to rock. Once I put that sweater on and, and I'm wearing the creative hat, I, I don't want to take it off and I just, I float away for the day. So what I have to do is I have to block out time and it's because of the way I work creatively, it's very rare that I will do business and creative in the same day. I usually will say, okay, I, this day is all just, this day is going to suck. This is going to be all the planning. This is all the structure stuff that I've got to worry about for the week. This is my emails. This is talking to people, etc. And I'll block that out for a day or days and then I'll block out creative time and I circle those in red because that's going to be a fun day and then I'm like okay this day nobody talked to me I'm just going to go off and just kind of fly away and I've had to structure myself that way because I used to try to do multiple things in the same day and, and toggle between the two and it just it, it it didn't work out I think both sides suffered the creative side certainly suffered and the business side sometimes suffered and so like what Kim was saying because I completely agree with everything that you say um, is that if you're not good at something don't deny it, don't fight it, realize it, admit it, and then find somebody that is good at it. There are certain things, I am not a plumber. Good God, and I am not, I can't handle, so I hire a plumber, because if I get in the, you know, under the, under the sink to try to fix them, we're gonna flood the whole house. Um, so I know that, okay, that's not in my, my skill set. I need to find someone that can do that for me. Accounting, for example, that's one of the first people I've got is I got someone that handles all the accounting, because I'm horrible at math as well. Um, so you, you find the right people um, that can do the things that you can't. And then there's some things that I'm very capable of doing. I can absolutely do this, but it's a time sucker. And, and I, there's so much more uh, things, better things I could be doing with my time than doing this tedious task that even though I can do, if I just farm this out to someone else or bring someone else on to do this, that frees me up to be able to pour more energy into the business side of it or pour more energy into the creative side. So it's, it's man, it's time management. It's, and everybody's different. I'm sure we're all different in our own way. It's, you know, you have to understand yourself, know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. And, you know, it takes time, but you finally, you get a rhythm of yourself and you understand, okay, if I do things this way, I'm probably going to be more productive than if I do things this way. And you kind of find that sweet spot. And uh, it takes a while, but it's like once you find that sweet spot and you're in the groove, then it's all of a sudden it's just like choo -choo, things start to move uh, really fast for you. Yeah. Can I just interrupt? Go ahead. Okay, cool. You guys both had like some really good stuff that I just wanted to distill again because I feel like there's such amazing and important points. What you said about working for other people and seeing business, you know, we get so much education here to be great creatives, but this isn't an MBA program. You know, when you start learning about blended bill rates and what someone's going through and you see their process, whether it's something you're gonna gleam and be like, I wanna run a business that way, or you're like, oh no, nightmare, like I'm never gonna do that. Like, which sometimes those are the better lessons, but that's, it's a great way to learn on someone else's dime. And there's so much that I learned, like working at small boutiques and small businesses that help me understand, like how do I wanna form my team what are the services that I want us to offer? How do I want to structure our bill rate? How do I want to be able to figure out how we're going to be profitable? And that's something I think as an isolated freelancer, it's one thing, but when you have multiple folks, it, it changes that dynamic a lot to set it up. You know? And I think, Tim, you had an amazing point about being a good employee and taking ownership as an employee. Rick, you had great points too. I don't want to leave Rick out. And Jason as well. <laughs> well, one, you know, one of the things too, just to add on to that, <laughs> It's like, you know, when, when you guys, some of you will go out there and become freelancers 
And what you have to realize is when you become a freelancer, then you're running a little one-person company. So it's a great place to practice because you have to be able to, uh, uh, you know, keep your creative hat on and, and sell what people are paying you for. But then you have to have your bookkeeping, your accounting, your taxes, all that stuff in line. So it's like, it's great practice of running a, a small company. And I loved what you had commented on about, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, a polar opposite quality sometimes to business and to creative. And I think you have to be able to um, kind of be nonlinear and jump back and forth and be able to be in that space where anything's possible and you're inspired and you can create and you're free flowing and you're not limiting your creativity because of a fear of a business limitation or a decision. You know, when Jason was talking about sometimes clients that have a low budget and high expectation, you know, uh, I still, when I'm wearing the creative hat or when I'm designing or when I'm leading a team of designers, I still wanna aim for like the craziest thing we can design and then we can, we can analyze it later and decide if we're gonna show it later. But I never limit the creativity because that is the, that's what you're selling. So you ha I think one of the keys to business is understanding the priority of things. Understanding one, yes, you have to make more money than you spend. That's gotta be up there in your top three at least or else you're out of business, right? And two, it's like, you're selling creativity. So maybe we shouldn't do anything that undermines that. Maybe that should always be on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should treat that like with the importance it deserves. So the understanding of what's important and the way that you have to balance that is so critical. You know, I think one of the challenges when you're in school, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, I was, you know, when I was in school, I was very young here and I was still learning how to be responsible just for myself. You know, you're going out into the real world, you have to learn how to be responsible just for yourself as a human. And, and uh, you know, the, the thing with business is if you don't have self-responsibility, if you're not a responsible person, then you're gonna go out of business. So uh, the, the key to business is you can't pass the buck. You can't wait for somebody to come over and fix it for you. You can't call somebody else to make it happen. You have to, you know, go in every day and even if you don't like it, you have to do it because that's what being responsible and running a business is. And that's what's, you know, it's kind of interesting, your point um, being, uh, how many of you here have perfect attendance? Yeah, right on, okay. So that's, that's step number one, right? Um, to showing a potential employer that, I mean, for, for us, that's, I know it seems silly and it's kind of like the nerd award or whatever, but I totally got all the nerd awards when I was here, by the way. Um, but like I, w I had three years of perfect attendance while I was here. And, and jumping off of what you said is that the number one thing, there's a couple things that you guys can take away from this. Number one is be on time. Number two is be dependable and consistent. Like if you're consistent and dependable, you can be a pretty, and, and don't be a dick, you know, like, the, I'm just gonna, one. sorry, yeah, that is, that is number one, but you know, just don't be a jerk, right? So we gotta spend a lot of time together, no room for, you know, for ego. Um, but seriously, like, you know, it's, I can't tell you how many times, um, like I take my job very seriously, and, but I don't take myself too seriously, but I know that the only way that I've gotten to where I've, I've and all of us really have, have been able to achieve what we've achieved is that we've been consistent on time and, um, and you know, really not jerks. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, I know um, you guys have been talking about um, the importance of a team. Of course, you need a team to be successful. And um, Tim, you mentioned about um, one of the ways you help a, t help a team work is to uh, be transparent, let them know how they fit into things. Talk about um, how you manage a team, how you motivate a team, how you select your team. Um, how do you put that together? Um, I think I, I, I can't stand accounting, but I really love team building. And both are absolutely critical to business. Um, it goes right into the dependability. It goes into knowing your people. It goes into allowing them to have unlimited creativity and the team knowing that you can provide that context. So, you know, management can really take a number of different forms, but in a creative environment, you really run the risk of always killing off that creativity because the business element has to take priority. And Nathaniel, I love what you said because 
really our job is to foster that creative environment. And you, you know, any creative endeavor, there's gonna be a time where you have to either abandon it, stop it, cut it off, or switch directions. And that could be a very personal thing for the people that are actually, you know, slaving away, creating the pixels, or creating that sound bite, whatever it might be. It's a personal thing for all of us because we're all creative. And so at some point in time, you need to cut it off. And, and we're looking for people who understand both of those worlds. And my job, one of the things I love about team building is creating an environment where people feel free to do that, yet they understand that one of these days we're gonna have to either move on or we're gonna have to final it. And the, the thing about a team is that in every company, even though we do different things, there is a dependency. And you as students are kind of operating at times individualistic, but even if you're freelancing, there's a dependency. You're gonna hand off your work to someone else. And what we do is incredibly complex. It's this crazy, super high-end technology that has to fit within the budget and fit within the creative process. But we have so many interdependencies where everything that we do in a team, each individual team member, whatever they do is gonna affect someone down the line. And I've, I've, I've had many days where I'm there on a Saturday without being on my family because someone made a decision. And there I am on a Saturday. And it frustrates the you know what out of me, right? <laughs> so being in business, it's really about the team has to understand their interdependencies. We do something at my company called a scrum. And it's part of the agile development process for software engineering, but we're working on something to, to actually do it for artists. And so we come in every morning and we're, we're developing an asset right now and we've got eight people. And we get in a circle, you don't get to sit down, you have to stand up, every person has two minutes to kind of say, this is what I did yesterday, this is what I'm trying to do today, this is what's holding me up. And what happens is everyone all of a sudden goes, oh, you're doing that, you might need this. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll add that to my day. And you wind up seeing very clearly the interdependency. And when people start to realize how much their work affects whether or not people get to go home on time, it builds a totally different environment of self-awareness outside of your own context. And you can enable that kind of team building by like a scrum is a way in a format to be able to do that. And it's really transformed the way we do our business because people are, instead of being really, you know, like if you're an assembly line, it's just, well, I just do this. Hey man, that's all I do. That's all you hired me for. Compared to going, I know where I'm at in the process. I know what I'm gonna be receiving and I know how I'm gonna give it downstream. And so that immediately starts to build a level of self-accountability and coming into wherever you go, understanding the context of who, who go, who's before you and who's after you and ensuring that you can help blur those lines properly and being self-responsible within that is a huge thing for an employer. And so that's one way that we build in a team environment is we help understand how we are all interdependent in the creative process. <clears throat> Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of blue sky thinking. Um, if you're not, you, should, you guys should definitely do some research on it. But it, 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 uh, essentially what blue sky thinking is, is this. There's no such thing as a bad idea. Um, because to, to come up with something really creative and really unique, sometimes you have to go completely abstract before you dial it back and dial it down to what it needs to be. And I've been in, on too many teams just growing up and stuff where you would throw out, a, and, and I'm a very abstract person as it is, I would throw out an idea and someone would just kind of scowl at you or make you feel, feel like, that's stupid, you know, whatever. And, and that's really frustrating um, for the creative people and it just kind of like, you know, it, it inhibits people from really opening up. And so I'm a huge fan of blue sky thinking. The idea is simply this. We need to do whatever the task is. Just start launching out ideas. No matter how silly or how crazy or how obscure the idea is, it might not be a good idea. It might be, for all intents and purposes, a bad idea. But that bad idea that I throw out, well, he goes, well, yeah, that, that is kind of a little crazy. But what if we did this instead? And it's still not there. But then she jumps in and goes, well, yeah, but what if we did the two of those together and we did it back? And then he jumps in and we come up with something really cool and amazing that we would have never gotten had we just started off with, let's think of a really cool idea. It's not like the first thing out of our mouth is going to be that idea, but that process of just kind of spitballing, throwing it out there, and then just jumping on everybody's ideas and morphing them together, 
then you're more likely to come up with something really cool and creative and completely unique that you wouldn't have gotten had you started off that, you know, with the intent of coming up with that idea in the first place. So, um, yeah, blue sky thinking, you guys should check it out. But I really promote that heavily in the, in the, uh, at the chop shop because that's, that's where you come up with some really cool ideas. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, i will just, honestly, uh, I feel, and I mirror so much of what you just said, uh, I, I really believe that fear is the enemy of creativity. I've said it a few times at some of the other uh, panels I've been on. Um, but especially for a, a newer kind of team member or somebody right out of school, sometimes you hold your creative ability so much in line with your emotions, and sometimes your emotions fuel your creativity. And when you start selling your creativity for money, you really have to learn how to be able to kind of splinter those two worlds off and, and not take everything personal and let your work be malleable, not hold it so precious. So in my shop, you know, what I do with the team is I really create a culture where I try and uh, minimize any kind of fear or, you know, I want people to be able to say a silly idea. Uh, I want people to say something that's way off the wall because it leads to innovation, it leads to new thought, and it creates a culture where people feel safe. And for creative people, the, the ability to be comfortable and speak from your instinct or say something where you're going out on a limb because uh, you know a creative idea at its beginning is very vulnerable. And uh, it just takes one naysayer to stomp something out that could be something beautiful. So um, you know, I really kind of share that blue sky approach at my office and, and we try and you know, instill that in our people. And when, you, you know, when you're giving uh, creative critiques to your classmates, keep that in mind. You know, it's good to give constructive feedback and, and all that, but uh, uh, be open to what something could be. And, and I feel like my job at the studio is to protect vulnerable ideas in their beginning form. Let see the potential of what could be good before you see all the bad. You know, I, there's so many people uh, feel like they're intelligent if they can think about all the ways to shoot something down, they can see all the problems with something. I try and create the culture where let's look at what could be beautiful or positive or really right with something first. I don't think it takes very much imagination to imagine how something couldn't work. That feels pretty easy to do, really. Uh, so I try and create the culture of let's think what's beautiful and let's refine it and let's get in there and, and work that way. So it really a, a very similar kind of uh, vibe, I feel. Nate used to one of my favorite words, which is naysayers. <laughs> I have a, a friend that owns a studio, and uh, right around the time that I, that I went to go and found Make Amazing, I went to their anniversary, and they had buttons that just said, naysayers be damned. <laughs> and, I was, I, and I have one, and I love it. And every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. It's hard to do something that you believe in because you really have to own it and feel it in your blood. And, you know, creativity is this amorphous kind of, like, happenstance thing, but there is a very serious structure to business. And when it comes to teams and talent, you know, I think for me, one of the biggest things that really helped me figure out like what I'm doing was that I sat and like created a very serious org chart about a very abstract idea. And that's not anything that I had ever like really seen or been like a part of structurally. I had always been so much in the creative department and the creative side of things. Um, it was a very painful task, um, but it's something now that I am very situated in business, I'm really happy that I did and understanding, you know, I'm not gonna be able to have a team that large necessarily right now, but I wanna know who are the players that I need to facilitate the dream project. What does that structure look like? That way I can communicate with folks who have bigger organizations, who are doing bigger things, what my vision is, what the eventual like pie in the sky project, how I'm gonna be able to facilitate that and understanding what the road looks like to get there. Not just where the end goal is and the first step is, but developing your vision of seeing that whole road of what that looks like um, is huge. And for me, teams are everything because you know I, I structure my company as a, a consultancy. So everyone that I work with are literally um, my peers. A lot of times I refer to myself as just the human and not as the owner because it's really unfair because they're much more talented than I am and successful than I am. Um, but that's, you know, my selfish privilege of wanting to have a business where, you know, I think it's a, like an Ogilvy quote where, you know, if you want to start a business, find the people smarter than you and hire them. Um, that's, you know, the, some of the advice, you know, I look to some of like the great pioneers of creative agencies of like, well, what are, what are their foundational, you know, quotes and philosophies and, you know, what did they do to be able to be these behemoths? You know, there's a, the book of a hundred Leos, which are all like Leo Burnett's quotes of when he first started his agency and, 
I mean, Ogilvy's got a million, like you could kind of go on for days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I'm finding talent and I'm finding team members, I'm a big try me person. So like if someone's got an idea or a project or they're like, hey, check out my reel, I have this thing, I wanna build it. Um, you know, having uh, like a coffee meeting and like a discovery with a person, even if it's not an interview, if you're not really sure if there is a position or a future there, getting to meet people will help you develop an idea if it's the right team or the right structure or the right person. Actual person is right there in front of you. But you know, if you're really locked in to like, no, I have to wait or no, this doesn't fit, um, it can be, it can be much harder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I wasn't sure either. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. Okay. <laughs> no, um, the, one, the one thing that um, I wanted to point out, I don't know if, how many of you guys have experience uh, playing sports or um, have, have you all played some sports? Okay, so you all know, okay, good. Um, and then, or in a, in a band. Um, so I think what's, what's interesting in the workforce is like being a team member on a sports team or being a team member or <laughs> being a musician in a band. So, um, you know, we all have to, whether it's a, you know, if we just take the band analogy, if there's four people in the band, everybody is, needs to play in sync and at a relatively the same level so that nobody's outshining each other to enjoy the full spectrum of sound and the music, right? Um, same thing with a, a huge symphony. If you have one viol violinist that's playing out of tune, you're gonna hear that. Um, much like a, a business, um, every job and every role, especially in a small business, is super, super important. And at Royale, what's, what's kind of interesting in the, the, the way that we've set up the structure is um, usually you would go from the top down, right? You'd have the partners, and then you'd have the creative directors, and then you have the executive producer, and then you have blah, 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 all the way down to the intern, right? So it's a top down. Um, I thought it was really innovative because my business partner, Brian um, Holman, decided to flip that chart, right? And it made so much sense in a creative studio. So now the partners are the foundation. We're at the bottom, right? And then our, everybody else is there to support the creative all the way up to the top of the intern. So, we, so if I'm not doing my job, I'm not providing a, a, a solid foundation for my team, I can't expect my creative to thrive, uh, who, who are at the top. Our product, if you were to sell a product, is creativity. And creativity is created by humans, not robots. Um, we need lives. It's important. We have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to have emotions, we actually have to go on vacation because we have to pull those uh, experiences into our work when we're faced with a deadline of two days to come up with the world's best idea. And it's between you and three other awesome companies. And our company chooses not to work people throughout the weekends. Our company does chooses and tries to treat the employees with respect and, hum and humanity, um, most companies out there don't. Most companies expect you to work the weekend. Um, and so if I'm going up a against a company in the same realm, when we win, then it's a big win because not only did we win creatively, but I also won the fight that I don't need to burn people out in order to uh, create, to have the best creative. So. It's super important, especially when you're thinking about when you're trying to enter the business. Um, Sebastian, Chris said something really awesome a couple years ago that's always resonated with me and it made sense for my career. You wanted to do the job that nobody else wants to do, right? So if you're looking at a team and there's a position that needs to be filled, whether it's the front desk receptionist, but it's at the studio of your dreams, take the front, front desk receptionist job and not only take it, but rock it out. I mean, like do it and do it well. You know, don't bitch about it, don't moan about it, don't say I'm a full cell grad, and I'm yo, I'm awesome yo, you know. Like just go in there and if you need a solder, um, <clears throat> you know, a circuit board, or you need to pour a cup of coffee for one of your coworkers, do it with a smile. Trust me, I've done so many jobs in my career that I died a little inside because I had to do it and I did it with a smile, and that creates opportunity for you because if you can do that job really well, I know that I can put you on a bigger job um, 
say Nike, right? So if you can, if you can animate the logo um, of a job that you might not really want to be on and do it with a smile and do it really, really well, I'm going to put you on a really, really great project and give you a chance. Okay, can I say, great. Can I, can I say? Go ahead, I, sure. I just love what you were, what all you guys were saying. I mean, enabling your team to be creative without fear is like the absolute key yeah. to doing that. And one of the things that we all were talking a little bit earlier about some of the sacrifices that we've had to make is doing the job that no one else wants to do to enable the team right. to not have the fear. Right. And I, I'm very blessed that my three other business partners are servants. And that's a perspective that I keep hearing through this thread is that we all realize that some of the decisions that we have to make as a business owner is to serve our people. And not just because we want to you know, make them feel free to be able to be creative. It's because it's in the nature of how we want to run a business because not all businesses create that environment mm -hmm. for their people. And you will gain more respect and more team environment when you choose to serve. And maybe it's in the, maybe it is being the receptionist is how you start, but taking on that servant leader perspective of, yes, I'm in this position right now in my life, but if I'm serving the people around me, it is going to change the environment. And I've, I've seen situations where people come in to a culture and they choose to take on a servant attitude and it completely fit, flips the whole environment and people come together. And then that's when creativity can kind of burst through when it's been stagnant for a while. And as a business owner, we constantly have to figure out, you know, like what you were saying, I'm going to separate this day because I know I need to serve my people this way, even though it's not a red circle day but it's what I need to do to serve them, so. And, and, and you know, to the point, it's like, one of the things that just came to mind is um, under promise over deliver. Like, you go into a business and you are cool with being the receptor. There's nothing that makes me more happy than to watch somebody do a real shitty job, and I know you're doing a real shitty job, and to watch you thrive doing that real, shitty job for the sake of the team, right? It's not about you, it's about the team. And you're doing that job to, to, to serve a purpose and there's nothing that makes me more happy and want to enable somebody who has a great attitude, who shines in that position. You don't want to take on a position where you're underwhelming because then, you know, not only it's doing a disservice to you, it's doing a disservice to your team. But if you can, take on a job that might not be, you know, what you really ultimately want to do, but you got to think about your career as, as, as like, you know, it's, you're going to be doing this for a long time. So this is one stepping stone into ultimately where you would like to be. So. And, you know, we, there's uh, you hear the word <coughs> serve up here a lot right now. And what's interesting about that is right now we're speaking about us as business owners serving our company, our employees serving us and the clients. Uh, but even if you zoom that out a little bit, uh, the purpose of a business is to serve people. Uh, one of the challenges, I know some of you are in the uh, program studying entrepreneurial, uh, what is the title of the program again? Uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Right, and, and so um, I think one of the challenges is when you're in school, you almost are, I mean, you're here to serve yourself. You're here to learn and your responsibility is to be uh, inward focused and learn how to use the tools and do this and that. When you start a business, you have to serve other people. One of the challenges if you start a business too soon, in my opinion, is um, you're still learning how to sell your creativity. You're still learning what buttons to press right now. You're still learning how to infuse heart and soul into the technical skills that you're learning. Now, when you own the business, you have to be able to do all of that while you have the stress of serving people. And, and sometimes the people you're serving, the clients, are extremely demanding or something's unfair or it's, you don't have time. And when you're still learning what buttons to press, when you're still learning how to get that heart into your creativity, and when you're learning how to do it for a paycheck, there's new pressures that you don't feel here at school. And um, so my caution <coughs> is, you know, owning a business and, and running your own business is very rewarding. Uh, but I feel like it's, you know, something if you rush into it, be aware that you're still, you're going to be learning a lot of new things at your first gig. Um, so, you know, I, for me, the pathway of getting a full-time job, going freelance, aka starting a one-person company, and then now having my business, allowed me to get comfortable with my creative skills I'm selling when I'm in the hot seat under the gun and need to deliver on a deadline for money. And, and uh, if you can't do that and just be okay with that and have it just flow, 
and manage the business, that's, that's almost impossible. So you really have to understand what you're getting into before you embark in, in trying to open your own studio or business, in my opinion. <laughs> a, a good, a good advice, Nathaniel. And following up on that, I think uh, we have time probably for. I'll, I'll ask one more question, and then we'll go out to the audience for questions. But what's the one? What's one thing that, or a couple things that you know now that you didn't know when you started the business, or something that? What's the best advice you can give to our students who do hope to own their own their own business one day? Who'd like to start? I'll jump in. If I had to give myself advice when I first started, it would be this. Um, and you've said this a million times, and I tell you what, I'm going to put a plaque on my wall with it. It's as fear is your enemy, um, but fear is imaginary for the most part. Um, there are things out there to be really, you know, frightened of, like sharks. <laughs> Although Tom would just punch him in the nose. But there are things that will kill you, yes. And there are things that are going to damage your business. But the reality of those things are happening are so insignificant next to what reality really is. Don't be afraid. Um, and just go for broke. I really, if I would have went for broke when I first started, I could only imagine where I would be now. I played it really safe, which I'm not really a conservative person in general, but I played it pretty safe. And I think if I would have went a little harder and would have um, ignored my fear and just overcame my fear, I guess, more than that. Um, I think I would have been a lot, lot farther along. So um, don't be afraid. Um, don't be foolish. Make calculated and wise decisions, but don't be afraid to make those decisions and execute those decisions. Yeah, yeah you know, I think for me, the one thing I would say is tying into some of that, um, sometimes I feel like when you're learning a new skill, it's easy to uh, not take on responsibility. But if you really look at it, the motivation sometimes in that is fear. There was opportunities early in my career that I had that uh, I turned down because I feared that I wouldn't be good enough at it or that the quality of my animation or my design wouldn't, wouldn't support the opportunity. And that is so the wrong mindset to have. Uh, you know, I think now what I really understand is when you take a dreamer's attitude and a dreamer's heart and you combine that with the mindset of taking on new responsibility every day and, and assuming new responsibility and, and uh, you take that kind of anything can happen creative side and you combine it with action. Uh, the action is the critical part to make the daydream come mm -hmm. true. So um, I think earlier in my career I could have uh, been more uh, thoughtful with my actions and I could have embraced responsibility and, and embraced deadlines and, and embraced the fear more uh, and owned it um, rather than succumb to it. Um, so that's now what I try and really do in my daily life. And, and I, I still think, hey, this is wonderful. I'm here at Full Sail. This is a Hall of Fame. This is, we've had some success. This is great. Uh, what can I do to take on more responsibility? How can I continue to dream bigger dreams? So that would be what I would have started that mindset sooner. Tim? Um, I, a lot of businesses fail. There's a huge percentage that do. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay to fail. Because if you're dreaming big and you're taking action and it fails, it's about the personal journey. I, I really love the story of like going out and freelancing and learning a lot of stuff and then starting a business and being mature and ready to start it. But there's such a pressure to have success in our culture. And for me, success is the personal growth in the journey of stepping out of the nest, starting a business, and it might not work. And for me, I've had to kind of be okay with that and get to the point where I've had days, my, my business partners and I joke around, of days of absolute, utter, total failure, where we could not have screwed up every decision more than what we did. And we, we've realized, you know what, that's okay. Because there's nobody's going to go out there and be like, I know every business decision that I'm going to be faced with on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm going to hit it out of the park every time. I'm successful, boom, drop the mic, I'm out. <laughs> it just, that doesn't exist. I mean, we can probably sit around and tell you about days where it's, you know, I, I start the day in failure and I end the day in failure. But the next day we might have a little victory. And so we are so afraid of failure in our culture because it, it is so associated with our personal and self-worth. And I think you have to reverse that. 
I think you absolutely have to reverse that. The moment you start, step out and wanna start your own business, you are going to have failure. It might be, the, the only grace that I have right now is that none of our failure decisions were company killers. That's it. We haven't made a decision that's completely killed the company, but I've made a ton of failures mm -hmm. in my decision making. And that is how you grow. And if you're graced with having your business stay alive within that context, awesome. But that's, that's, that might be what is considered success. So you really have to adjust what culture wants to tell you running a business and what that equals success compared to understand how failure actually enters the mix and becoming comfortable with that and really flipping it on its edge and going, this is about my personal growth. I'm gonna fail, but I'm gonna take that failure, I'm gonna do something with it because I'm gonna still move forward in my dream. Yeah. And ignore the critics and the, the totally. you know what I mean? The Screw haters. Screw the critics. The, Dude, the, try something different. The failures and things like that. You know, <laughs> when, when you do a business, you take risks, you have a lot of people, you'll come out of the woodwork and critique you and, and like haters come out of the woodwork. But you know what? It's like, that's because you're doing something, you're doing something different. So what you're saying is so on point, and you'll see if you try something that doesn't work or you try something that's a little rocky at first, you'll see how many haters come out of the woodwork and just use it as fuel and just take the high road and just like keep your eyes on the prize because you know, it doesn't matter what they say. Yeah, I said this uh, in, a, in a panel that I did yesterday, but uh, it's, I, it's a naysayer thing, so I think you'll enjoy this. But there are negative people are going to be with you your entire life, unfortunately, and they're, and they're going to be there in three steps uh, of your journey. Um, when you decide what you want to do and you tell them, this is what I'm going to do, the first thing they're going to tell you is, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. Then once you start doing what you said you were going to do, they're going to stand by and go, yeah, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and then when you finally do, what you said you were gonna do, and you show it to them, the first thing they're gonna say is, I could have did it better. <laughs> You're never going to win with those people. You have to ignore them, they don't exist. And you literally, you have to block them out. The moment you listen to them, you're feeding it, you're giving them control over your mind. You're allowing them to put fear and doubt in your head. You have to just ignore them. You know, um, there's, a billion, there's billions of people on this planet and um, you know, they're not all gonna like what you do. Does that stop you from moving forward? Absolutely not. You have I mean, to do it for the people that are gonna appreciate what you're doing and most importantly, you gotta do it for yourself. You gotta be able to look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and go, man, I hit it out of the park. I did exactly what I wanted to do. I mean, I would, don't, I would don't jump give off into the negative people. I would, I would piggyback off of that and just say, um, uh, definitely negativity is your worst enemy for sure. I'm sure y'all experience it here. I did when I was here at Full Sail. Why didn't we have? Why don't we have this? And why don't we have that? And why am I mean that? And I'm like. You know, what I learned early on was just fucking own it, you know? Like, own your career, you know? Go, if you want it, go do it, you know? Nobody's gonna sit there and serve anything in your life on a platter. You actually have to go out and, and do it. And my whole thing, look, I graduated from this college with the shittiest demo reel ever. And I still talked my ass into my first job in Los Angeles after getting laughed at at my first <laughs> my first interview. I mean, you have to just believe that you're meant to do this. If you don't believe in yourself, go do something else. Seriously, don't waste your time, don't waste my time if you don't believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, you will figure out a way to make it happen. It will be frustrating. And constantly, I come up to that challenge with myself on a daily basis with the business. It's like, am I doing the right thing? Yes, I believe in myself, I believe in my vision. I believe that, and I'm owning it. I will own my career, I will own it. So my best advice to each of you is just go do it, like own it. Don't be scared, figure it out. Everything will be fine. <laughs> figure out what your niche is. And you know, in five, 10 years from now, and trust me, when you get into the workforce, that shit's scary. I'm just saying, like, you know, you sit down in the, in, in the hot seat, and I remember the first time I had an, anime, an animated, uh, a concentric circle in After Effects. It took me like two days to do it. And my creative director kept coming in and putting pressure on me and I was just like, I was, I was really scared. And it's normal to be nervous. But you know, it took me a while and then I figured it out. 
So just own it, believe in yourself, you'll figure it out. Even if you're not the best designer, if you're not the best animator, figure out what you are good at and capitalize on that. I never thought I would be an animator. I opened up After Effects in, in full sale. I had a two week course and I was like, this is bullshit. I never wanna, I'm not gonna be an animator. What did I do? I found a niche at the company. What did they need? An animator. What did I do? I got up every morning at six o'clock in the morning. I went to a cafe. I did a tutorial. And you know what? In three years, I became one of the best. Well, I'm not going to say that, but I, well, I'll I walk. Say that. I say that. We work in the same circles, him and I. And he anyway, I, I would walk in and people's eyes would be like, holy crap, how did you do that? And you're so fast and all this and that and the other. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> It's just natural talent. <laughs> no, that shit was hard work. <laughs> so anyway, that's my advice. <laughs> Kim? This has been like all the best <laughs> advice ever. You know, I, I was talking with somebody while we were all hanging out last night and there's a quote from a book, The Artist's Way, that I really love that is, you know, don't worry about the quality, just worry about the quantity. Mm -hmm. If you just keep making and you just want to do, you're going to get good. That's how practice works. Mm -hmm. And Practice you know, makes perfect. Yeah, and that's one of those things people are like, how did you get to own a company? Like, oh, and it's like, <laughs> how did you get to play in Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Like, yeah. it's not any different. Like, we got to where we are because we did, you have to do the stuff. It wasn't like we just woke up and we're like, go down to the factory, you know, place and get our company. Like, thanks, guys. And we're old now, or at least I am. Hush. I'm, I'm old. I'm like, I've probably been in business more longer than you guys have been alive. <laughs> Um, I am. Um, oh, yeah. no, sorry, I didn't even <laughs> stop on your jam. Come on, guys. Go for it. Go for it. Um, I, I think I want to make my advice just to be different about the word innovation because we talked a lot about owning because we all own like creative firms and tech mm -hmm. firms. But you know, if it's if you're thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship and you're starting something that's truly revolutionary and new and different, that's you know that's going to be different and harder. And you're going to have all the fear and the negativity and all these things are going to come up and you know, it's important to remember when you're thinking about like the big innovators of the world, the biggest, the best, they have launched some of the crappiest stuff that we don't remember. And that's really important for every new release that Apple puts out and everybody gets super stoked and they reinvent and they change everything. People get the place in their brain that remembers that like ugly cube toaster that came out with gets like smaller. But like that was a huge failure. Cube. Like it was one of the worst innovations. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, but that helped them get to the next place that gets to the next place, gets to the next place. You know, and that's, you know, it's not wrong for you to look at that path and kind of compare it along like what you want to release and what you want to think about. And, uh, you know, I think putting in the time and doing the work is going to get you there. You know, there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no quick way. And you really, you, it, it just happens over time and then it, all of a sudden it feels kind of like magic. And I think, you know, there's no recipe for it. I think we all have gotten older and then when you turn around you're like, oh shit, like, I know what I'm doing. Like I truly, <laughs> absolutely, like from start to finish of my day, like today I know what I'm doing all day. Like that's a weird feeling because for the first, you know, 10 years that you're out like navigating around there's always a moment in the day where you're like oh shit is somebody gonna come in here and tell me that this is totally not the way to do this because you're on that bleeding edge you're doing things that are new <coughs> and um mm -hmm. you know i always i always love i work with some younger folks and we'll all be on an email or something be happening and um they'll be like what are we gonna do like get batting down the hatches and i'll be like no 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 guys it's a trap i have the answer and i'll feel like like magic but it's you know, it's one of those things in creative business, like, it's a trap, you, it's a trap guys. Nobody answered the email. Like, and that's... You'll die. You'll die. I'll we'll die. But no, you know, let's, I want to talk about death just for, like, a hot minute. You know, one of the things... <laughs> speaking of death. Speaking of death, though. No, you triggered, like, another thing, because we're up here, and, like, I think every time somebody talks, I'm like, oh, I got to ah, and I'm like, shut up. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I really love when we're in meetings, and, like, somebody gets really heated and, like, excited, we all have to be like, all right, guys, settle down nobody's going to die <laughs> about what we're doing right now. Like, we are, like, yeah, like, this, we're not curing cancer. Like, we're making visual coolness. Like, we're making soundy stuff. Like, this is, you know, like, we're in a very soft, like, kid glove kind of career. Like, yeah, like, 
clients get really angry. There's a lot of money and, you know, vanity and stuff on the line. But, you know, that's really not going to hurt anybody. Still going to breathe. <laughs> like, you're going you're gonna to get home. Your house will still be there. Like, you know, there's no Gestapo that comes in. Like, you did not get these in time. Ah, like, the ninjas come and take over. So, you know, don't, don't get too crazy with yourself. You have to be gentle with yourself if you're going to listen to your guts and, you know, follow what you believe. And you can't do that when you're being like, hug yourself. Hug yourself. Yeah. If you're being like hypercritical with yourself all the time, you know, that's, that's a balance that you need to find between pushing yourself and hugging yourself that makes you a good leader, you know, because you can't be like a stressy lunatic and then lead folks. It's a little weird when you hug yourself, but it feels good. All right, good advice. <laughs> We're going, we have a little bit of time to take some questions from our audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will come around with a microphone. Those of you online, um, the online moderators will, will try and work with you on it. We're going to go ahead and take a question from um, our YouTube channel back here in the back. Okay. Hi, so I have somebody who asks, how do you temper your own taste to remain objective when you're working with a bunch of creative minds? Well, you know, our job as a designer and as an animator for a client at, at my shop, I really feel like is to listen. And so it's not really, to me, it's not really a challenge to be objective uh, because uh, the objective is to serve them. Uh, you know, so uh, a lot of people ask me, where do you get inspiration? Where do you, where do you, where do you, how do you stay inspired? Well, I think a great place to start is with the brief that the client gave you because you can go out and look at inspiration or you know, walk in nature all day long, but at the end of the day, if you can't find something interesting about what they wanna sell, then you're probably the wrong person to do the job. Uh, so the way to be objective, to me, is to lean in more, get more curious about you know, what the client's asking you to do, and then just you know, keep your eyes on that and focus on that. Okay, we got anybody one. else? We got one over here. Okay. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, finish. Anybody else? No? Good? No, I think yeah, that was great. Okay. Dead on. Thank okay. You. One question over here. Slam dunk. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jeremy Locke, and I'm in a recording arts uh, program. Um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur for a few years now, and one of the biggest issues that I'm coming across is um, finding funding and finding the amplification source to get my business out there and to uh, be a a viable you know, competitor in the industry. Can any of you uh, elaborate on what steps you took to find funding and that source to get your business out there? So you're asking how to get funded? Mm -hmm. You use whatever you have and you start there. Because the moment you think, well, I'm gonna be a professional when I raise this amount of money or when I have this piece of gear, or I'm gonna start my bit. No, you start with what you have. If you've got one seed, Plant it in the ground, wait for it to grow, then harvest some more seeds. Take those seeds, don't eat your seed. Take those seeds, put it back in the ground, and, make, and you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and after a couple of harvests, all of a sudden, boom, you've got an orchard. But don't wait. Use whatever you have at arm's length. Um, it, it doesn't matter, you gotta start somewhere. And the first thing you do is gonna suck. Guaranteed, first thing you do will suck. The second thing you'll do will suck, but it will suck this much less. And then you keep that process going, and then, and then before you know, there's no finish line. You know, it's not like, are you, are you guys finished with your career? That's death. Hell yeah, I'm just getting started. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, it's great to come here and like, woohoo, we did it. But it's like, okay, but like, this is like a mid-break for me. I'm still right. in the middle of this, you know, I got more fight in me. <laughs> but there's no finish line. So don't think of it as, okay, I've got to do this to get to here, and then I'm done with my career. No, it's like, it, it's every single step. Every single day, every single moment, it's a process, it's an evolution, and you're not gonna finish. I don't plan on retiring, I'm sure I might one day, but the point is, is I wanna continue to grow, and whatever I have at arm's length is what I'm gonna use to get me to the next level. And when I'm at that level, I'm gonna look around what I have, and I'm gonna use that to get me to the next level, yeah. I, I, you know, one of the things that I thought was, um, as I was just thinking back about funding, um, you know, I, I love the little bubble that sometimes I, operate in because I just think I can do it, right? So I like thought that I could just walk into a bank and say, can you give me $150,000? 
um, here's my resume and my contacts, and um, I'm awesome, and I'm gonna make an awesome business, basically. And they were like, here's five grand. And I was like, yeah, okay, so that's gonna buy two and a half computers, right? Um, and I thought it would be easy because I really believed in the business. I had a business plan, all, like, I, I don't know how to write a business plan, but I wrote one, um, and I had, my, all my contacts, you know, I thought for sure, you know, this is a slam dunk, easy. And they were like, well, you know, do you have savings? No. Do you have this or that? So you, I had nothing to really back up the financial plan. So one of my buddies um, actually uh, was an angel investor, and he gave me $50,000 um, to start Royale. And basically that lasted us maybe a month, maybe a month and a half. Um, but that enabled us to get our first job, which then enabled us to get our next job, which then, you know, about a year and a half later, he was actually in some trouble, and we still owed him money, and I, it felt really good that I could cut him a $35,000 check and give it back to him, um, uh, because at that point, that's how much we owed him. Um, <clears throat> so having some sort of fiscal responsibility to him um, was good, because it made me feel responsible that I owed one of my best friends, a lot of money, um, and that just propelled us. And it felt really good to be able to help him out in need. Yeah, one, one last thing I'll quickly add on to that because there's a bunch more questions. Uh, I always <coughs> think in my life, uh, things happen to me and come to me when I make myself ready to receive them. And it's hard to think what that means maybe, but uh, I think the more that you could really kind of distill down what would that money really do for you? And yes, that's like a simple answer. Well, I could buy gear, I could do this or that, whatever. What would it really do? Would it empower you to create differently? And when you could find the essence of what that would do for you and give that to yourself without having the money, I know that sounds weird, but I, I really mean it. When you make yourself ready to receive something, uh, it's amazing when you pour that love into it, how all of a sudden new opportunities seem to appear. And I've seen that not just in my life, but in a lot of people's lives. Oh, I wanna answer it too. Go um, I'm an outspoken bootstrapper, you know, and early on in my career, I got some awesome advice. Um, my good friend Craig Harrison, who's a grad, uh, and he said, you have to eat sand to shit bricks to build a pyramid. And... Boom. For me... Yeah. <laughs> That's like a slow clap. I had something to say. I'm not going to say anything now. But, no, seriously, like, I, you know... Even while I was a creative director and overseeing a team, I would still take on like, oh, I met a dog walker at the park and oh, she needs a website. I'm still gonna design that website on a Saturday afternoon and turn that, that mofo around and get that money. And that money is gonna go into the little pool of money that I kept to know that I'm gonna do something. And whether it's gonna be to build a big piece of art, you know, there was a moment where it was like, okay, am I going down this path? Am I gonna like, buy a home and start this commune for crazy people, or am I gonna go and start this business? And the business just made more sense. Because I'll do the other later for us. If you want money, investors wanna know what your skin in the game is. Yeah. If, you, if you just rely on just their money to just get you launched, it's, it's not gonna work. The seed idea is perfect. I also am a, we're a bootstrapper. I used my 401k, my wife's 401k. Every business partner put something in we're completely bootstrapped. It hurt in a lot of different ways and it, and it really restricted us in some things, but we're in a position now where, you know, our skin in the game is full on. It's fully in. So when I come to the table with investors, when we're looking for funding, I sit in a completely different leveraged position at that table. And that's something to always keep in mind because it costs money to get money. Yeah, I'm wait, wait, dead. Wait, oh. uh, no, 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 I'm gonna forget. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, I've been in a couple of companies that have gotten purchased, um, and I think that the feeling of that, I also have known some folks that have seed that's investors, it's not angel, and if you're starting a business to be a boss, to be an entrepreneur, if you get folks to invest in you, you are not the boss. You are every day in debt to someone else who is gonna have a lot of probably ideas and thoughts about what you need to do and how you need to be and what you should be operating on. And you know, really do you need this nice coffee? Folgers would be the same, but you know the creative folks, like they do not want Folgers. They are not gonna produce the best work doing drinking Folgers all day. So no hate to Folgers, but 
you know. So, you it's, know, it's... It's the best part of waking up. <laughs> it is the best part of waking up. So, you know, keep in mind that, like, you know, money isn't... That's not going to buy you the freedom you might be envisioning, you know. And there's, there's a lot of other ways to find funding. And right now, more creative ways than ever before. And I've helped a lot of very kind of odd, techie, bizarre companies find their way through Kickstarter and, mm. you know, crowdsourcing and things like that to kind of start and launch themselves. And that's a much different kind of ownership and funding and they give back and it's, um, you know, we're in a really great time to be able to do things like that. Do we have time for one more question? I'm sorry. No, you said exactly. Nope, yes. out of time? Okay. <laughs> we're out of time, so. Oh. Great advice, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Jason, Kim, Nathaniel, Rick, and Tim. Uh, awesome advice today, and thank you for being with us. Thank all of you for attending. Have a great day.